God's word. You'll have to forgive me. I've not used one of these Madonna mics before, so I'm, if I break out into singing, we'll, we'll be all right. I've got hands to use and everything. Everyone all right? A lot of you will, will remember me. Just to make you feel old, I'm 28 now. Um, I shave three times a week. I, I've, been, I've been married for four years. Uh, my wife is Welsh, which, which ultimately means I get a better place in heaven. Um, <laughs> We, we, have a, we have a one-year-old little boy. And we have just the one. I'm told we have just the one. I'm convinced there's three at some times, particularly three o'clock in the morning with the screaming. Um, the one thing I've learned from parenting is that clean clothes are never clean clothes. I came out this morning with a freshly ironed shirt and jeans. I've now got biscuit crumbs. I've got cake. That, that was my cake. Uh, I've got water everywhere. But it's good to be with you. And I just, if I could, just take 20 seconds just want to take this, this is the only, probably the only chance I've had in the past few years, just to say thank you. This, this ha- was and is my home church, this is where I grew up, this is where I was born into, this is where I was developed. There's people in here that were uh, my youth leaders, I spotted Steve Kenyon before, hi Steve, nice to see you. Nick Vernon was the, the first person that gave me a chance to lead worship, and the first time I led worship, I guarantee you, it was awful, it was so bad, but he still supported me. There's people here that, that if, I, if I don't mention you by name, please forgive me. But um, let's get down to business. I'm sure you've come to hear, hear God's word, and let me share that with you this morning. So if you've got a Bible, turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, and uh, we're going to have a look at a parable this morning for the next hour and 42 minutes. <laughs> I hope you've got comfy shoes on. It's going to get good. Matthew chapter 20. If I could just give you a bit of context as we go into, into, the, into the, the scripture. Jesus has just talked to a rich young ruler about entering the kingdom. I'll explain a bit about this in a bit. He's talked to him about entering the kingdom, how he needs to leave everything behind and, and give up everything so that he can truly follow Christ and truly enter into, into his kingdom, enter into this incredible relationship. And then it comes on to, to chapter 19, verse 27, And Peter, who sometimes needs to put a sock in it, doesn't realize it. But he says, then Peter said in reply, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? So Peter's asking this question to Jesus, saying, Jesus, friend, we've left everything to come follow you. All our friends, all our family, our jobs, every bit of security we've left just to come follow you. So what will we have? In other words, what's our part of this deal? And then we come on to Matthew 20, starting at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went, and going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to you this last work as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with, my, with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. If you're honest, how many of you would like to work an hour a day and get the same pay as a full day? <laughs> uh, great, I've just seen honest people like it. I want to pick out three things, if, if you'll allow me to this morning, that hopefully will challenge you, encourage you, speak to you at where you're at as well, and then we'll, we'll see what the Holy Spirit wants to do, if that's all right. Would you, would you pray with me quickly? Holy Spirit, would you come and have your way this morning? 
What we really need is not just empty words and, and not more of me, God. What we need is more of you. What we need is an encounter with you this morning that will leave us never the same again. So would you breathe life this morning into everything that I say? God, would you use me as your servant this morning to bless these people? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The first thing I want to point out is there's, there's always two types of service. There's always two types of service. We see in the scripture that there's four groups of people, the ones who were called at the start of the day, the two in the middle, and then the group at the end. But in all four groups, there's only two types of people. There's the first group, and they agreed with the owner the price for the day. They'd set, had discussions, they'd bargained, and they'd agreed that they were going to be paid one denarius a day. A typical day's wage for a laborer. One denarius a day. Happy with that? They set to work. All the other groups, if you've noticed, never had an agreement with the owner. So the first group had a bargain, had an agreement. Two, three, and fourth groups, all they did was the owner came to them and said, you go to work in the vineyard and I will pay you what is right. What I believe Jesus is getting at in this part of the parable is the heart of motivation of serving. This, this church I know is, is a church that serves Serves each other, serves the kids, serves the youth, serves the community. You can't lead others into life without having a foundation of servitude. But what Jesus really looks for, and we know the scripture in Samuel talks that that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God is really looking for people who will serve him with everything that they have, even if nobody sees, and even if nobody notices what they're actually doing. People don't see what goes on behind scenes. How many of you came to church this morning and thought, oh, God, I'm so thankful for the PA team. I'm really grateful for those people that I, I don't see. I don't see all the hard work they've put in, but they serve with everything that they have. Without that, you won't be able to hear me, which some of you are probably thinking, mm, could mm, take it or leave it. Without that, you wouldn't be able to see the words, which would really hinder you being able to enter into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. The heart of, of serving is everything that Jesus is looking for. And we see Peter's words when he says, well, we've left everything to follow you, so what will we have? You can see the kind of tongue-in-cheek of him saying, well, what's, what's, what am I going to get? What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? I've left everything for you. This is the same thing as the first group. It was almost Jesus' way of, of a, little, a little way of saying to Peter, look, Peter, we had an agreement, yeah, but there's going to be people who are coming who don't care about an agreement. All they care about is a word. All people in the two, three, and fourth group cared about was the word of the owner which said, you go into the vineyard and I'll pay you what is right. We have a heavenly father who can give his word and we can be sure, because scripture says that he is not like man that he should lie. He is, we've sung it this morning, you're a good, good, I nearly broke out into song, Madonna Mike's taken over. <laughs> we sang it this morning, you're a good, good father. You are Perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. Anybody agree with me? He's, he's a perfect father this morning and every morning for that, for that matter, really. But the, the, the motivation of our heart is what he looks at. And it's important that we guard this heart. Proverbs 4, out of the heart flow all the issues of life. Everything that you do comes from the heart. And we Christians, we're good at the Sunday smile. We're good, we're good at putting it on. We're good at the, how are you? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm amazing. Everything is great. Everything is going so well. Everything in my life is perfect. I've got the perfect job, perfect marriage, perfect kids. Everything is great. And yet, if you were to look at the heart, I wonder if we'd see something different. I wonder why you serve. Because you do serve. If you're married, you serve your spouse. Do you serve to receive? I wonder if you do something in church, if you're in the worship team, the kids team, the youth team, there's so many teams. Everywhere's a team. Everything's a team. There's no iron team, but there is an iron win, coincidentally. Put that out there. Why do you do what you do? That's what Jesus is really looking for, is why do you do what it is that he's called you to do. Can I, be can I be really honest and really kind of open with you this morning? Speaking in front of people is both a privilege and a challenge. Can I tell you the biggest challenge is pride? 
Because it's, it's really easy to think that you're something. <laughs> when really, I'm probably the least. I stand here preaching God's... This is the word of God that he breathed. And what's most important is not how I look in front of you, but is the motivation of my heart bringing his word to you right? How you serve on a day-to-day basis is what he looks for right deep inside your heart. Both groups recognized still ultimately that the owner was a good man. They made an agreement, the first group, and they went to work knowing that the agreement would be fulfilled. The other, the other three groups went to work knowing that he would pay them what, his right, what was right. We can be sure that God is faithful. If he's, if he's started something in you, he is faithful and just to bring it to completion, the Bible says. So if you're in the middle of the most horrific journey, take heart and take courage, knowing that this is not the end. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not though I am stopped and camped in the valley of the shadow of death. Though I walk through the valley, your purpose is to carry on walking. And he is faithful and just, and he will bring it to completion. Why? Because he is good. He is good. He has never once failed you. His scripture even says that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never let you down. Can we be honest? It feels like he does sometimes, doesn't it? If we're honest, it feels at times, and we've all prayed those prayers, God, where are you? Never leaves us. Never forsakes us. I wonder which group you would be in if you think about your life the way you serve. Which group would you be a part of? Would you be the group that goes with the agreement? Would you be the group that bargains and says, I'll only go as long as you pay me right? Or would you be the group that says, whatever, I don't even need paying because just the honor of serving is enough for me. Second point I want to make is about the last group of people. In, in, in biblical culture, what would happen was that in the marketplace, Everyone who was a laborer would go stand there at the crack of dawn, which if you're a parent, I've learned what that means, 100%, time and time again. Sick, wow, if you're one of those people that gets up at six and goes for a run, hate's a strong word, but it's close. <laughs> it's, it's close. The last group of people. So throughout the marketplace, throughout the day, the owner comes in, and if, if you were there, the people that would be picked first would be the, the strongest workers. They would be the best workers, the ones with the best reputation, the ones who would be the right age and the right build that would be able to work through the scorching heat and through all of the, the strenuous lifting and moving and all sorts of difficult work. They'd be the ones that would come first. Then as you go in, you'd pick the next lot and the next lot, and finally you'd get to the last group. And there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that this last group of workers are lazy, or irresponsible. The most likely thing is that these last group of workers are the weak. They're the ones who are crippled, who were lame. They may have been the ones who were too young or too old. And they're the ones that were picked last. It's bringing back flashbacks of school for some of you, I know it's, it's difficult. They're the ones that would be picked last. The unwanted workers. And if we're honest, I think every one of us can relate to being unwanted, to being rejected, to being despised. They may have been unwanted because of a criminal record. They may have been unwanted because of a past that they couldn't shake. They may have been unwanted because of shame that they didn't feel they were good enough to have removed. They may have been unwanted because of guilt that showed on their faces that made the owner think, I don't know if I could take them. Unwanted workers. At some point in our lives, we've felt rejection. At some point, we felt the pain of being not good enough. We felt that. We know what it feels like to to be treated as not good enough. This is what the last group of people felt. There's, there's, There's a man in Scripture that relates perfectly. We know him as King David, but at the time, he was just plain old Dave. If you turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 16, I'll read a bit more. I, 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 like, I like more Bible than me. I think, it speak, I think it's better than me. So. 
So let's, we'll read as much as we can. I could probably take the next, the, the last hour and 12 minutes with just reading the Bible. 1 Samuel 16. If I'd just given over you, because it's a long scripture, and I, I, I don't have too long left. The prophet Samuel is coming to anoint the next king of Israel. And he, he knows that he's got to go to Jesse. And, and one of Jesse's sons is going to be the next king. And so the prophet Samuel comes to Jesse's house. And Jesse lines seven of his sons up to meet the prophet. And so he comes, Samuel comes along, sees the first son, and says, Surely this must be the king. Big lad. Looks good. He could be a good king. <coughs> Excuse me. God says, that's not the man. So he comes to the second man. He said, this, this must be the king. He's just as good looking. How, how many of you would love seven? So I, it, it would, I think it would do my head. And if I had seven sons that were really good looking, <laughs> dear me, you're going to have to get a big stick to fight off all these girls. It's bad enough having one boy. He goes along this whole line of all seven sons. None of them, God says, are the, are the next king of Israel. And then Samuel says to Jesse, have you not got any more sons? And Jesse says, I've got one more. Imagine being one son of eight, and your father only deemed seven of them worthy to stand before the prophet. So Jesse says, I've got one more son, and, and this son is in the field tending the sheep. He's the youngest, the weakest, the least of all of the sons of Jesse, unwanted, rejected by his own father. And so the prophet Samuel says to him, bring, bring him to me. Bring him here. Let's have a look at him. David, meanwhile, is in the field, tending sheep, day-to-day -day life, not realizing that God's plan for this unwanted shepherd boy is as the next king of Israel. Not realizing that as he has stood there, singing his songs, writing his psalms, worshiping in his own way, he doesn't realize that he's royalty. He doesn't realize his worth. He doesn't realize the value that God has placed on him yet. And so they get him out from the field and he comes in. And, and if you've been in church, you know, you know the story. Basically, Jesse comes up to him. This is the next king of Israel, the youngest of the eight boys, the one who was unwanted, the one whose father thought seven should be it, not the eighth. I wonder how many of you feel like number eight. How many of you feel like the eighth person? The one that's unwanted, the one that's been in the field, the one that no one cares about, the one that people have forgotten about. And yet you don't know that you're royalty. You're sat here this morning and you do not know your value. You do not know that the God who created the heavens and the earth sent his son to die for you because you are the most valuable thing that he has. The most valuable, the most precious of his creation is not the incredible greenery, the incredible scenery, the incredible lakes and seas and oceans. The most incredible creation is you. The most incredible thing on this earth, the most powerful computer on this earth is your brain. Did you know that in, in this universe, if you've, if you've um, seen Louis Giglio's DVDs, he does one about the planets and the stars, and he says in one of them that there are 300 billion known, known galaxies. We, our earth, is in one galaxy of the 300 billion galaxies. And yet that very God who holds that, who measures it in the span of his hand, knows your name. He is the very God who created your innermost being. He formed you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He is the one who gave you a plan and a purpose. He is the one who knows how many hairs are on your head. Some that's a quicker job than others. He is the one that values you so much that you may feel like you're the one in the field that nobody cares about, that nobody wants. But he's the one who calls you by name out of the kingdom of darkness and into this glorious kingdom of light. The father of love wants you. Scripture says in 2 Peter that you are now a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's who he declares you to be. You, if, if, just take this personally, you are a chosen people. You are not unwanted. 
You are not the least. You are chosen specifically. The best way I can, I can get this over to you is if you think of, of children, if you think of childbirth, if you think of the difference between adoption and biological. If you're a biological child, you were born to your parents who had no choice over your hair color, eye color, how tall, how much you weighed, how long and hard and, and loud you screamed, no matter how many times daddy says, no, don't scream, stop it. If you're a biological child, your parents had no choice. If you're a parent of a biological child, you had no choice over that child. But if you're adopted, then your adopted parents specifically looked at you, looked at your records, looked at your history, and still chose you. Scripture says that in, in Ephesians 1.5, that we are predest God has predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Sons is both male and female. He has predestined us for adoption. You and I are adopted. We know the song, Father God, I wonder how I manage. Oh, the mic's taken over again. Now I am your son, adopted into your family. You and I were adopted by the fa our father, our heavenly father. That means he looked at you. That means he saw all of your shame, all of your guilt, all of your hurts. He saw your rejection and your pain. He saw your grief and your difficulties and all of your fall downs and still sent Jesus to die for you. Scripture says that while we were still sinners, while we were still stuck in that rut, while we were still doing all of the wrong things that we're doing, while we were still making mistake after mistake after mistake, while we were still sleeping with that person when we shouldn't be, while we were still going out and drinking when we shouldn't be, while we were still telling those lies when we shouldn't be, he still went to that cross. He still would have gone to that cross. And he still went to that cross and hung on that cross, nails pierced through his hands, through his feet, a crown of thorns on his head for you. Knowing everything that you've done, knowing everything that you were going to do, says Christ died once and for all. His sacrifice was enough for you so that you no longer have to feel unwanted. You no longer have to be rejected. You can come into his family and know that you have a place and know that you have a purpose and know that he has a plan for you which will blow your mind, which is far better than a plan that you could ever create. There are no unwanted people in his kingdom. There's no unwanted people in this room. On, on this earth, people may have told you that you are not wanted. People may have told you that you're not good enough. People may have said to you that they don't want you near them. That, that why, why should I be friends with you? Why should I marry you? Why should, why should I be near you? And yet God says, come to me. All who are thirsty, all who are weary, all who are weak, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you a place. I'll call you my sons and my daughters. He's a good, good father. The last, the last point I want to make is about grace. You can't speak about Jesus without talking about grace. Scripture says that he is full of truth and grace. This, this parable isn't really about the laborers. It's not really about the people who are working. The parable is about the owner. The parable is about the grace of the owner that would give people a purpose and then give them a reward. It may seem that the reward wasn't fair. If you were a business owner, which some of you probably are, if you had a worker who worked eight hours a day solid and you had a worker who worked one hour a day, would you pay them the same? Of course you wouldn't. It's not fair. And yet, we should be glad that God's kingdom isn't built on fairness. It says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fairness means that we get what we deserve. Justice means that we get what's right. Remember that the owner said to the workers, you go into the vineyard and work and I will give you what is fair? No, I'll give you what is right. Justice demanded that a payment be made because we were sinners. Justice demanded a payment that we could never afford. Is it fair that we got away with it? No. Is it fair that Jesus, the only perfect human, the only 
holy person to ever walk this earth who never sinned, who never did anything wrong, is it fair that he then got our punishment? No. But was there another way? No. That is the only way, and he now is the only way to the Father. He now is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to get to the Father, to come into the kingdom except through Jesus. It's not fair. We talk about grace. It's a word that you'll hear a lot in church. Grace, if you take the biblical meaning, comes from the word charis, not the name. I can't spell it. It's Greek. The only, I, but I'm sure you've heard loads of preachers say the only Greek word I know is kebab. It's true. It's true. It means his undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor and kindness. We talk about the grace of the owner, how he has shown the workers kindness. He gave them a job and then rewarded them. They didn't deserve the same reward as the first group, but he still rewarded them. Why? Because he's gracious. It's not fair, but it's grace. It's not fair that Jesus went to the cross for us. It's not not fair because he did nothing wrong. But we needed a perfect sacrifice and he was the only one that could do it. And do you know whose choice it was to do it? It was his. It was his. He prayed in, in the Garden of Gethsemane that, God, if you could, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. For you and for me, Grace is not fair, but the whole of the gospel depends on this unfair exchange. You know what we we get? You can see Peter's question now, like we've left everything to follow you, so what will we have? Let me tell you what we have. We no longer have condemnation. We no longer have shame or guilt. We no longer have no hope and no future. We no longer have no purpose. We no longer are rejected and unwanted and despised. We are now chosen, forgiven, loved. We have a hope. We have a future. You have a purpose. If you're still breathing this morning, which please, God, let everyone still be breathing, (laughs) then you have a plan. You may have come into the vineyard at the very last hour of the day. You may have only just gotten saved. But let me tell you that, that you're here for a purpose. You're in this church for a purpose. You're on this earth for a purpose. So don't ever feel and don't let anyone ever tell you that there is nothing left for you here. Because he is faithful and he is just. There is a plan for you being here. There is a reason why you're on this earth. And God has given you something that no one else has that only you can give. Don't fall into the trap of comparing it. The first group fell into the trap of comparing their pay with the other groups. Jealousy blinds us to the purpose of God. Jealousy blinds us to the grace of God because we see someone else as having more than us. We see someone else as getting more favor than us. And what happens when when we let jealousy creep in, it becomes a fence. And when we give the enemy a foothold, if you give him an inch, he will take a mile. We have to remember that it was an unfair exchange that saved us. The reason we're here is because of Jesus. You may be here this morning and it may be the first time you've ever heard of Jesus. Do you know what? It may be the millionth time and you're sick of it. But let me tell you that he loves you. Let me tell you that he loves you. The the, the first song that a lot of you will remember, Grandma Grace. She's still going strong, dear me. I don't know how she does it. She, she, she used to teach me this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It seems really simple and childish, but do you know what? It's the ultimate truth of the gospel, that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever, whoever believed in him, doesn't matter what background you are, doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, doesn't matter how big or small, it doesn't matter if you felt rejected, it doesn't matter if you're still feeling shame and guilt, if you come to him, he loves you. He loves you. It's the whole center of the gospel. It's the center of this church is that Jesus loves you. It's that he 
offers his grace to you. He offers you a position. Do you know what amazes me in, in the end of this scripture? If we just skip back to Matthew 20. If you read just from verse 12... These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in scorching heat. But then the owner replies this, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Have you noticed that they've now gone from laborer to friend? Their their, their job, their purpose was as a worker, was as a laborer, but that's not their position. Their position is now as friend. Your, your purpose on this earth, may, you may be a preacher. You may be someone with an incredible gift of hospitality. You may be someone who makes the best cup of coffee in the world. But that's not your position. Your position, I no longer call you servants, but I now call you friends. This is your position in the kingdom, is that you are now a friend of God. A friend of God. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who holds all the oceans like a drop in a bucket to him. This is the same very God that calls you friend. Ultimately, what I think this parable is about is the goodness of the owner. We know that, I know that goodness is the foundation of all of God's character. You know the scripture in in Exodus 33 where Moses prays to God, show me your glory, what does What does the Lord reply? He says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass before you. He could have said anything at this moment. He could have said, I will cause all of my love. I will cause all of my faithfulness. I will cause all of my justice to pass before you. But he chose his words carefully. He doesn't waste the words. He says, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. Scripture says, Psalm 119, 68. You are good, and what you do is good. It's the foundation of everything that we are, everything that we do, everything that we will become, is because he is good and what he does is good. Do we understand everything he does? No. Are we, are we going to understand while, us, while we're on this earth everything that he does? No. I've got a lot of questions. A lot of questions that I do not understand. I don't understand why people get taken from us before they should. I don't understand why, why children die at birth. I don't understand But what I do know and what I have to be sure of is that he is good and what he does is good. And we can be sure that he is good because he's faithful. And if he's faithful, then his goodness will continue. It will endure forever. This whole story is about the goodness of the owner. It was the goodness of the owner that gave them a place and a purpose. It was his goodness that gave them a reward. It was his goodness that then calls them friend. Psalm 23 says that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's what's chasing after you, is his goodness and his mercy. I wonder if, if you're here this morning and this Jesus seems quite intriguing. It seems too good to be true. It's true. There's a lot of people in here that will testify to his goodness. Goodness doesn't mean that all our circumstances are sweet. It doesn't mean that our Christianity is, is fluffy. One of our friends calls it, was it jacuzzi Christianity? It doesn't, doesn't mean that everything is wonderful and every day is a sweet symphony. But what it means is that we can be sure that no matter what we face, he is with us. And that he's faithful and just to bring it to completion. If you're here this morning, I wonder if we could just close our eyes just for a moment, just to give some people some privacy. If you're here this morning and you want to know more about Jesus, you want to know more about his goodness, you want to know more about this grace that he extends to you, you want to know more about your purpose and plan that the good, good father has for you, Would you just put your hand up just for a couple of seconds? I'll see it, pop it down. It's not a problem. Is there anybody this morning that's interested? You don't, I'm not selling you anything. (laughs) Jesus speaks for himself. I truly believe that if you see Jesus for himself, he's the most irresistible person on this planet. And he loves you.
Thank you. Cheers. Should have asked for keys. It always makes things a bit more, a bit more holy. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you that you're good. I thank you that you are good and what you do is good. I thank you that you've given us a hope. You've given us a future. I thank you that you've called us out of the dark, kingdom of darkness and into this glorious light. I thank you that you've given us life and life in all of its fullness. And God, I pray that you would challenge us, speak to us, help us who may have lost our purpose, who may have lost our hope. Help us to re refine it. Help us to rekindle it. Thank you so much for your presence here this morning, God. Thank you for always being faithful, always being good. In Jesus' name, amen. Matt, thank you for that absolutely outstanding word to us this morning, wasn't that?